Welcome to this build session, where we'll be discussing data pipeline monitoring with ML-based Cortex functions. My name is Ellery Burke. I'm a product manager in the machine learning group here at Snowflake. I'll be presenting today's demo, which I built with Michelle Adar, my teammate and an engineer in the machine learning org as well. Our agenda today is first, to frame the problem we'll be solving in this session, data pipeline monitoring. Second, to discuss the solution, Cortex functions, and third, show a demo of how to build this data pipeline monitoring system. To start, what problem are we solving and why are we here now? Imagine, or perhaps this is true for you, you're a data engineer responsible for managing a growing volume of IoT sensor data. You know that your company has a large number of sensors deployed already and is bringing on more this year. Your responsibilities include making sure all of your sensors are online and are reporting error-free data. To date, you've had a few methods for checking the status and data quality of your sensors. But with this growing number of sensors, you realize you need a better way to monitor your sensors and your data. Ideally, something automated that can adjust the patterns in each sensor, that can scale as your sensor count ticks up, and that's easy to deploy. You certainly can't wait for your data science team to spin something up. Their backlog is way too long. This is where Snowflake's Cortex functions come in. Snowflake Cortex functions are SQL and Python functions with machine learning models under the hood. They abstract away the complexity of machine learning frameworks and algorithms to make activities like data quality monitoring through anomaly detection fast, easy, and robust. They scale with Snowflake's flexible compute model, and again, they're quick to deploy and easy to integrate into downstream analytics and BI tools. Snowflake Cortex functions include LLM-based functions like translate and summarize, but also ML-based functions like forecast and anomaly detection. The Snowflake Cortex functions we'll look at today include a time series forecasting function to help us predict just how many sensors we'll have five months from now, and an anomaly detection function to monitor the quality of our sensor data. We also have a function called Contribution Explorer, which can help you quickly identify drivers to changes in a key metric. For example, which region of mine saw the largest increase in sensor count? We have a number of functions coming soon as well, including classification, progression, and clustering to build out your analytical ML toolkit and solve problems like predicting customer churn, estimating the price of a house, and creating customer segments for targeted marketing campaigns. Now onto the demo. Our demo goals are threefold. First, to forecast sensor growth so that we know just how many sensors we expect to have online five months from now. Second, to set up anomaly detection so that we can monitor the quality of our data automatically. And third, to create alerts so that as our anomaly detection model runs and detects irregularities in our data, we get notified as soon as possible via email and can take action to mitigate whatever issue has occurred. With that, I'll switch over to the demo. The first thing we'll do in our demo is forecast the number of IoT devices we expect to have online five months from now. To start, we'll look at a table containing all of our IoT devices and the date on which they were activated. Activation is the date they were activated. DID is the device ID. You can also see that each device has multiple sensors, including power, sound, and vibration, et cetera. Next, what we'll do is create a view that counts the total number of devices activated, activated to date by day. And taking a look at this data, we can see that the number of devices my company has online is growing fairly steadily with some periods of faster growth followed by slower growth. So now we'll create a forecasting model to predict how many devices we'll have activated five months from now. To create this model, we use this create or replace Snowflake ML forecast command. We name our model devices forecast and then feed the model three important pieces of information. First, we feed in the view we created called total devices, which counts activated devices by day as our input data. This is the data the model will use in training. Next, we tell the model which column in our total devices view contains timestamps. In our case, this column is activation. Finally, we identify which column we want the model to train on and predict into the future, our target column. In our case, 
This is the total column, which is the count of cumulative activated devices by day. Once that's complete, we'll use the model to generate forecasts for the next 150 days or approximately five months. And once that completes, we'll store those results into a table called forecast, which we'll do here. And then if we look at that data, you can see we have a number of columns. And just to get specific, what we're doing here is calling our devices forecast model to generate forecasts and asking the model again, as I mentioned, to predict for the next 150 timestamps. And since the data we fed in were daily counts, the model knows to generate daily forecasts, as you can see, are generated here in the forecast results. So we don't have to specify when we're calling our model units or time intervals ourselves. And again, we're then using result scan to save our results into a table called forecast. If we're looking at our output, we can see our output contains a timestamp column, a column with our forecasts, and columns with the lower and upper bounds of an automatically generated prediction interval. We'll talk about this more in more detail when we cover anomaly detection, but the important thing to know here is that these lower and upper bounds define the range in which the model expects 95% of forecasts for a given timestamp to fall. The narrower this range, the more confident the model is in its prediction. Next, we'll join those predictions onto our historical, historical counts of cumulative devices activated by day. So we have a clear view of our total devices online by date, both historically and into the future. And if we add in our actuals and adjust a couple of options here, we can see in this chart that the model predicts will have about 11,000 devices online five months from now with periods of faster growth and slower growth, just as we saw in our historical data. That is a lot of devices. So now we'll move on to our next goal for the demo, which is building a more robust way to monitor our IoT devices for issues. As a first step, we'll look at our metrics table, which includes hourly measurements for a given device and sensor. Here we can see that this data has been subsetted to three devices and their power sensors. Next, we'll do a couple of things. We'll subset this data further to look at just one device. We create two new views containing data for device 3562, one with data up until October 10th, 2023, and one with data for October 10th through October 20th, 2023. We'll use the first view to train our anomaly detection model. Then we'll use that model to detect anomalies in the second view, the 10 days of data on and after October 10, 2023. Training an anomaly detection model is very similar to training a model for forecasting. We use the create or replace Snowflake ML anomaly, anomaly detection command to create a model we're calling device AD. Then we provide the model with a data set to use in training. This is our input data a timestamp column here called TS, and a target column that the model will train on, then detect anomalies on here called value. We are choosing not to use the label column name parameter. You can use this if you know that there are anomalies in your training data set and you flagged those rows, for example, with a one. Passing that column into the label column name parameter indicates to the model that it should ignore those rows in training. But once you're using anomaly detection on a recurring basis, you can pass in previously detected anomalies into this parameter as well. We then ask the model to detect anomalies on those 10 days in October using this call command to call the device AD model we just created. Unlike with the forecasting function, we need to pass in a data set when we call our anomaly detection model so that the model has data points to analyze and flag as normal or as anomalies. So we pass in our 10 days of data in October into the in input data parameter. We identify which columns are the timestamp and target columns, TS and value, as we did before. And we also decide to specify a prediction interval value of 0 0.9, which is an optional parameter. If you leave this out, the model defaults to a value of 0.95. The important thing to note here is that the prediction interval size sets the percentage of your data that the model is likely to mark as an anomaly. As in, the lower the prediction interval value, the narrower your band of normal is from the model's perspective. 
and the more anomalies your model will flag. The higher the prediction interval value, the fewer data points your model will mark as anomalies. So now we can look at the results. In our results, we have a timestamp column labeled TS. We have a column returning our actual values labeled Y. And we have columns returned by the model, including forecast, lower bound, upper bound, and is anomaly, among others. The forecast column represents what the model expects the value of your series to be for a given timestamp. And lower bound and upper bound represent the lower and upper bounds of what the model considers a normal range for your time series. More specifically, the range between these bounds represents the range in which the model expects about 90% of possible values for this timestamp to fall, since we set the prediction interval value to 0.9. Any data point falling outside the lower or upper bound is marked as an anomaly. The additional columns here, percentile and distance, are there to help you understand how irregular your anomalies are. For example, the percentile value indicates what percentile in the distribution of possible outcomes your data point corresponds to. If this percentile value is higher than the prediction interval size you set, then your data point is marked as an anomaly. Distance is another way of describing how far from normal a data point is. You can read more about these in our documentation if you'd like to dig in. If we view our chart results, we can see that there are clearly spikes and dips in our sensor data that are irregular, like this one, or this one, and these data points also clearly fall outside of our model's lower and upper bounds and are therefore, in our data, marked as anomalies. Viewing this data with the model's prediction intervals helps us build confidence that the model is doing a good job of flagging potentially erroneous data points. Now that we're confident in the model's ability to flag anomalies, we'll expand our anomaly detection to the rest of the devices and sensors in our metrics data set. First, we'll switch to a larger warehouse to allow for more parallelism while we're training our anomaly detection models. Looks like that worked. Then we'll create two views of our metrics data again, one with the data we want to train on and one we want to detect anomalies on. They'll cover the same date ranges, one with all data up until October 10, 2023, and the other with data from October 10, 2023 through October 20, 2023. Next, we'll create an anomaly detection model kick that off using almost exactly the same SQL we used above. The only change is that we're using a data set for training that includes all devices in our metrics data set. And we're feeding the model a device ID using the series column name parameter here. This device ID is fed into the series column name parameter and indicates to the model that it should partition the data, the training data, by device ID and train three separate models under the hood, one for each device ID. The benefit of this series column name design is it makes it easy for us to scale our anomaly detection setup to many devices and sensors with little change to our SQL code while taking advantage of the parallelism inherent to Snowflake's infrastructure. Everything else about this, this SQL syntax is the same as before. Okay, once these models are trained, we call the model to detect anomalies on those 10 days of data in October. Again, the only change we've made to our SQL here is to use the series column name parameter to separate our anomaly detection process by device. And once our results are stored into a table, which looks like it has worked, we can see that these data are grouped by device ID and have some data points flagged as anomalies. So we have device 3562 to start, and then eventually we'll scroll down to the next device, 37112, and there are some anomalies flagged in the data. And now that we have a model set up to monitor our data for anomalies, that we can easily scale to more devices and sensors. So for example, to all 11,000 devices we expect to have online by the end of the year, we want to create some tasks to train a new model on a regular basis so that we're taking into account any changes to the patterns in our data and to detect anomalies on a regular basis. We'll also set up alerts so that we can get an email whenever there is an anomaly, relieving us from the duty of manually monitoring for flagged anomalies. So first what we'll do is create a task to train a new anomaly detection model every week on Monday morning. We specify the schedule using cron timing here, 
And then we just nest in our model creation step. Next, we'll create a stored procedure to extract anomalies from our anomaly detection results. This stored procedure calls our model to detect anomalies, then stores only the anomalies into a table. So you can see the procedure calling anomaly detection and then storing only the anomaly results into a table here. When you implement this for your own work, just be sure to update your training data and data fed into the prediction step, here titled Anomaly Train and Anomaly Predict, with fresh data on the same cadence you train a new model and call your model to detect anomalies. Finally, we will create an alert that runs every hour, although you can adjust this to whatever cadence you'd like. And this alert will also send an email whenever anomalies are detected. The email will even include information about when the anomaly was identified. And that's it. We've now trained forecasting and anomaly detection machine learning models using familiar SQL to help us better manage our company's rapidly growing IoT devices. If you'd like to try out anomaly detection and forecasting right away, here's a quick start to try it out. If you'd like to explore more SQL innovations at Snowflake, please consider joining the What's New in Snowflake SQL for Builders session. Thank you for joining.